song this morning is, uh, again, one of my favorites out of the blue. Last couple of weeks, I got to pick all the ones I like. I really like them too. It's a gentle shepherd with this little typo in your in your hymn book, or in your bulletin, sorry. It should be uh, page 458. And uh, there's only one verse, which is just not enough for a song we love, so we're going to sing it twice through. 458, Gentle Shepherd. out 
and save what is lost, hear our prayers today. On behalf of those who are lost in our day, receive our prayers, our thanksgivings, and Lord, give us your unending compassion. Lord Jesus Christ, you tell us not to be afraid of what the future holds, not to worry about tomorrow, for you know how difficult we find it to heed these words. We do worry. We worry about so many things, Lord. We worry about our families, our friends, our circumstances. Some of our worries are big worries. Some are tiny, but still ever present. We come before you this day with all of our worries, the big and the little. With confidence, we know that we can lay all of these worries at your feet. We bring our worries about health and happiness and security for ourselves and for our loved ones. We bring worries about the world we live in and its future as we continually fail to address so many of the things you've called us to address, Lord. We pray that you would keep us mindful of the ecological and humanitarian problems that we can help be a solution for. We bring our worries about the way people in our world are treated. Father God, we know that you are concerned with every aspect of our lives. So we also bring the little things that concern us, those little worries that can keep us up at night. Living God, reach out to all of those for whom the future brings fear or uncertainty. Assure us that you are with us, even when the future seems uncertain, or when circumstances feel like they are spiraling out of control. Remind us, Lord, that you are able to transform even the bleakest of situations into celebrations of healing and wholeness. Lord, we make our prayers today in faith, knowing that your Spirit is at work in our world, making all things new. Redeeming, sustainer, visit your people, pour out your strength and your courage on us, that we may hurry to make you welcome, not only in our concern for others, but by serving them. All these things we pray as Christ our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We'd like to ask the ushers to come forward to gather today's gifts and offerings. First, an offering sentence from the Psalms from Psalm 33. Let everyone in the world fear the Lord, and let everyone stand in awe of the Lord. All who live in the world honor God. We honor God in the giving of our gifts this morning. If the ushers would come forward and receive today's gifts and offerings.
God of love and grace, you ask, not for mere offerings, but for our lives of trusting faith, lives that acknowledge your power and mercy. Give us faith that's deep and strong that we may follow you all of our days. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. to us from the Old Testament from Psalm 33 verses 12 to 22. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, he considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. To deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In Him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in His holy name. May, our, may your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. And the reading from the New Testament is in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. And now it's time for the gospel. Someone someday about this whole faithfulness that you're gonna talk about here in a little bit. What? You're not talking about a problem between you and Lily, and are you? No, 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 no. This has nothing to do with Lily. He's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> that, that. <laughs> Hold on. That's your domestic dispute. You and your dog aren't getting along. Right. And it's all because of this little guy. Come on out here, you. Mm. Oh, see, I'm going to be sitting for my shirt right now, and he's so cute. Just look at that sweet little face. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Oh, baby. 
Hey, big guy, settle down. All right, I've never seen you this, this upset before. Well, I have to admit, I'm not surprised. It looks like Fido is jealous of all the attention you're giving to that puppy. Dogs get jealous, just like people sometimes. What? Dogs jealous? But that's silly. Fido's got nothing to be jealous of. Oh, yeah? Well, you've been spending a lot of time, a lot more time attention with the puppy than you are the last couple of days, and you haven't shown it to Fido. But, 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 but puppies require a lot more attention than road dogs do. That's true, but you can't expect Fido to understand that. He's a dog, he's not a person. All he knows is you switched from spending all of your time with him to now playing with that puppy. And that makes him feel left out or jealous, maybe even angry. And you're right. Fido thinks that you've been unfaithful to him. Unfaithful? Well, so what should I do? Oh, wait, I don't hear. Good master, what a puppy? Um, no thanks. We already have a dog. Um, and I don't want to end up in the same boat you're in, bringing a puppy into our house, because I don't think our dog will handle that well either. <laughs> Besides, that's no solution, Malachi. All you have to do is spend some more time with your own dog, and spend it with that puppy, and the problem will go away. That's actually right, yeah. Uh, I think I think Homer's got a good point there. Malachi, you have to let Fido know that you'll love him, and that he can have faith in you, no matter what comes between you, that you won't abandon him or turn your back on him, just like we know that God won't do that to us. Fido needs to feel about you the same way David felt about God when he wrote this in the Psalms. This is from Psalms. Your, your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. The Lord is faithful in all he does. Oh, oh I'm sorry, Fido. I mean, I didn't mean to neglect you the last couple of days. I do love you, you know, you harmony little critter you. <laughs> now, that's more like a love and faithfulness. What it's all about. Very good. Let's pray, shall we? Okay. All right. God, we pray that just in the same way that you're always faithful to us, always there when we need you, that we might be faithful to one another, that we can always be there for one another when we need, when another person needs a friend or someone to call on and help, that we might be there for them. We thank you that you've given us this example of what it means to be faithful. In your son's name, amen. Amen. Thank you for that prayer, Pastor Rob. Okay, Malachi. What do you say we take over a a while and you spend some time playing fetch with Fido? Hey, that sounds like a great plan. Let's do it. Come on, Fido. Come on, let's go. See you all later. Bye. Hey, everybody. See you. All right. And you can remain seated and open your hymnals to. Hymn number 249, Spirit of God, Descend Upon My Heart, verses 1, 2, and 4.
Lord, as we contemplate more these fruits of the Spirit, and today especially the fruit of faithfulness, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, that's where we are in the fruit of the Spirit today, faithfulness. What is faith? That's a churchy word. I wonder if you've ever been asked that, or maybe you've asked it yourself. It's one of those words that we use a lot around the church. Faith speaks to something spiritual, something mysterious, maybe even holy. We call Christians people of faith. That word, faith, is sort of unavoidable in our religious tradition. It's kind of a central component of our, of our faith. But what is faith? What is faith? That's our topic today. And that was a regular topic for people who heard Jesus teach and preach. In our Gospels, the apostles are chastised on more than one occasion for having too little faith, right? Oh, ye of little faith. That's a repeated phrase. In Luke's 17th chapter, the disciples realize they are a little short in the faith department, and they plead desperately, Lord, increase our faith. We get a sense that faith has a calming effect. When we are afraid, we call that maybe a lack of faith. In that 17th chapter of Luke's Gospel, by the way, Jesus tells the disciples, it's not a matter of how much faith you have, it's a matter of how you use your faith. Even a tiny little bit of faith will do if you put it into action. Relying on it, in this sense, is not, uh, faith is not a noun, it's not something you have. It's more of something you do. It's, it's a verb. But what is faith? When I led the campus ministry at SIUE several years ago, one of my colleagues in the religious center on campus was a Roman Catholic nun called Sister Claudia. Several denominations of churches had a presence on campus. We all shared uh, the religious center there. But Sister Claudia and I seem to work mostly together. She once told her students a story about faith. She said there was once a nun who worked in home health care. She was out making rounds when her car ran out of gas. There was a gas station not quite a mile down the road, so the nun walked down there to see if she could borrow a container to buy some gas for her car. And the station attendant regretfully told her that the only gas can that he had, that, that he lent out to people, had just been lent out to someone else and hadn't yet been returned. But the nun was not discouraged. She was far too resourceful and resilient for that. So she went back to her car and looked around for something that she might use to carry some gasoline. In the trunk of her car, she found a bedpan. That'll work, she said. Very resourceful, this nun. So she took that bedpan back to the gas station, filled it with about a half gallon of gas, carried it back to her car. As she was pouring the gas into her gas tank, a couple of farmers happened to drive by. The sight of seeing a nun pour the contents of a bedpan into a car's gas tank was too much for them, and one of the farmers turned to the other and said, Boy, I thought I had faith. <laughs> Sister Claudia loved telling that story. What is faith? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That definition comes from the 11th chapter of Hebrews in the New Testament. Faith is knowing that we are never alone or abandoned by God. Faith is reaching out to God and knowing that God is there. When we choose to live a life of faithfulness, that doesn't mean that we are somehow immune to life's trials or sorrows. It does not mean that life will always be joyful and peaceful, right? Life is life. Life happens, and sometimes life is pleasant and nice, and sometimes things don't go the way we think they should. They certainly don't go the way we'd like them to. But through the good and the bad, through the happiness and the unpleasantness, all of it, we are joined with a cloud of witnesses, the book of Hebrews tells us, people of faith. They journey along with us through life, and they remind us as well that when we reach out, God is there. I don't believe faith is something you can stockpile or collect. I don't think faith is something you can 
brag about having more of than someone else. I think faith is more of a way of living than something you have. Like I said, it's a, it's a thing you do. It's not so much a, a noun, it's more of a verb. And to illustrate this concept of faithfulness, I want to tell you the story of one of our denomination's most faithful missionaries, a man named Adoniram Judson. And I know you've probably heard that name before. The name Judson can be found a lot of places in our Baptist tradition, especially here in Illinois, where we have a university named for him. Or maybe you've noticed that's the name of our denomination's printing house, Judson Press. Adoniram Judson. I used to tell Julie I wanted to name one of our boys Adoniram. I got voted down. Adoniram Judson and his first wife, Anne, were among the very first international missionaries commissioned from the United States more than 200 years ago. Judson spent more than 40 years in Burma, which is now called Myanmar, leading hundreds of people to lives of faith in Christ. He learned the Burmese cultures and the language dialects. This is the model that our missionaries still follow to this day. We don't presume cultural superiority over any other peoples. We don't presume to know what's best for another peoples. We take the time to learn about them, to establish genuine relationships with them, and then, in genuine compassion and hospitality and friendship, then we minister alongside of them. Judson gave us this servant-based model for church missions, and it's a model our international missionaries still use to this day. Judson was the first to translate the Bible into Burmese, and the Judson translation of the Burmese Bible is considered to be so accurate and thorough that it remains the most widely used translation of Scripture in Myanmar. While Judson was working in Burma, his influence was also very effective back here in the States. At a time when divisions were happening among the different Baptist traditions, divisions that still define us as a fragmented tradition of the church, Judson promoted Christian unity for the sake of missions. Judson would say, even if we don't all believe exactly the same thing, we can all agree to work together for Christ's glory. And that is still the spirit of our international missions. The story of Adoniram Judson is a story of faith. Nathan Finn is on the faculty at Union Theological Seminary in Jackson, Tennessee, and he wrote a nice little summary of Judson, some of which I want to share with you this morning. Adoniram Judson's father was a pastor, but not a Baptist. He was a pastor in the Congregational Church. Adoniram, though, was a skeptic. He could not reconcile the teachings of Jesus with what he saw in the world, the injustices and oppression that he witnessed in the world around him. How could God, who created and loved all persons, allow horrific evils like the slave trade to happen, or economic oppression of the poor? How could a loving God allow these sorts of things to become so commonplace these were the issues Judson wrestled with 200 years ago. If all things are within God's hands, why is there suffering in the world? Judson wanted that answer too. These are the things that bothered him on a spiritual level. So Judson went to Brown University for college, a Baptist school, by the way. I wonder if you knew that most of the Ivy League schools were actually started by churches. Harvard and Yale were congregational. Princeton is still a Presbyterian school. King's College, later called Columbia University, that's Episcopal. Brown University is the Baptist Ivy League school. While he studied at Brown, Judson completely stepped away from the church. He abandoned his faith entirely. He excelled academically, and he decided to go to seminary, which is an odd choice for someone who stepped away from their faith. He went to Andover Newton in Massachusetts. He did not go to seminary to train for pastoral ministry. He went to seminary so that he could study theology in order that he might find flaws in the Christian belief. He wanted to go so that he could prove there is no God. Through his theological studies, though, something happened. Judson found Jesus. 
Similar thing happened to C.S. Lewis, by the way, the author of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the Chronicles of Narnia series. C.S. Lewis was another really smart guy who studies theology as a non-believer so that he can tell us why we're all wrong and along the way ends up becoming a Christian. After Judson comes to Christ in seminary, he feels the call to go into the mission field. So he and a few friends, they form a missionary association and they are commissioned by the Congregational Church, the Church of his father, as missionaries to the Far East. They set off for Burma. But along the way, Judson has something of a denominational crisis. He was raised a Congregationalist. He studied at a Congregationalist seminary at Andover Newton. His father was a Congregationalist pastor. He was commissioned as a missionary by the Congregationalist Church. But in his heart, he identifies more with the Baptists, especially our practice of baptizing only those who want to be baptized. So Judson becomes a Baptist, and this creates a really big problem. The problem is that the Congregational Church is bankrolling his ministry. And word gets around fast, even 200 years ago, and Judson soon finds himself in Calcutta with no money, and no church support from his own denomination. And the Baptists, they don't support him. They don't know who he is. They didn't commission him to ministry. They're not gonna support someone they don't know. A person of lesser faith might have bartered passage back home at that point, but not Judson. He knew that God was calling him into the mission field. Being a person of faith does not mean that you're exempt from difficulties or challenges in life. So Judson pressed forward, and he worked to raise the money that he needed, and he established a small mission in Burma with his wife, Anne. And if you believe in luck, Adoniram and Ann Judson had the worst of it. The Judsons were frequently acquainted with sickness and suffering and even death. They lost three children. Adoniram's first wife, Anne, fell gravely ill, and not long after that, war broke out between Burma and England. In 1824, the Burmese emperor imprisoned nearly all English-speaking men because they were presumed spies for the English crown, for the British government. This included Adoniram, who spent 19 months in two different prisons. One of those prisons was overseen by convicted murderers who had been spared the death penalty in exchange for serving as jailers in the prison. Gives you an idea of the brutality that Judson experienced. Many prisoners died, but Anne's devotion kept Adoniram alive. She pestered and begged and even bribed so that she could provide food for her imprisoned husband. She even managed to smuggled in Adoniram's favorite pillow, into which was sewn his translation of the Burmese Bible. All the while, Anne was nursing an infant and raising two orphan Burmese girls by herself. Adoniram was eventually released from prison so that he could be a translator for the peace negotiations between Burma and England. But by the end of the war, that wasn't the end of the Judson's suffering. Anne died in 1826, followed by their two-year-old Maria six months later. And Adoniram spiraled into a deep, deep grief. He grew increasingly reclusive, having lost his wife and his daughter in the same six-month period. He built a little hut out in the jungle. He named his hut the Hermitage and spent 40 days living out in this little hut in the jungle, eating nothing but a tiny bit of rice. He even dug his own grave and spent multiple days staring into the pit, contemplating his death. The jungle was tiger infested. Many of the locals feared that Adoniram would be eaten. When he eventually returned safely from his self-isolation, everyone was shocked that he had survived. Adoniram increasingly emerged from his spiritual darkness with a new resolve to reach Burma for Christ. He realized that even in the midst of these darkest days, God had not abandoned him. After three decades of struggle and grief and illness and hardship, he eventually began to see the fruits of his efforts. 
I want to say that again. After three decades of struggle, he began to see the fruits of his efforts. Sometimes we get impatient when a new ministry takes more than a few months to catch on. Small village churches were being planted. People were becoming Christian. Judson also continued his academic work, translating theological literature into Burmese and mentoring the steady stream of younger Burmese Baptists who were growing in their faith and feeling called to leadership. Adoniram Judson died in 1850, having devoted two-thirds of his life to serving the Burmese people and growing the church there. By the way, the Myanmar Institute of Theology, a Baptist seminary, in Myanmar still celebrates Judson Day every summer. When we live lives of faith, we demonstrate the same courage and hope and devotion that was demonstrated to us by people who have come before us. People like Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David and Peter and Paul and all the other disciples. When we live lives of faith, knowing that God is there when we reach out, we can demonstrate the same perseverance and devotion as people like Adoniram Judson. All of our modern day global servants and missionaries serve with this faith, knowing that God will provide and lead, knowing that when they reach out, God is there. Living in faith does not mean life will be easier, does not mean that life will be more pleasant than anyone else's, but it does mean that we can face life with the confidence of knowing that God is with us, that God will use us for something astounding. There are people in this world who believe in God, and then there are people who have faith in God, who live their lives knowing that God is with them. That's faithfulness. Amen? Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord, as we hear this fruit of the Spirit, faithfulness, Help us to be mindful of those who have come before us living lives of faith. Help us to remember that faith is not something we have, but something we do. It's a way of life, a way of living rooted in trust and hope, knowing that you are with us. We thank you for the faithfulness of Adoniram Judson and all of our missionaries, all of our global servants around the world. We pray that in their legacy, we might also live as persons of faith here in our community. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Okay. If you would stand with me as you're comfortably able to sing a hymn of commitment, number 326, softly and tenderly. We'll sing verses 1 and 4. <laughs>
gospel tells us that after his resurrection, Jesus was made known to his followers in the breaking of bread. We pray that Christ's presence would be with us today as we fellowship together and celebrate the Lord's Supper with one another. Will you bow with me as we give thanks to God? Gracious God, in whom we live and move and have our being, we lift our hearts and offer thanks to you for the wonders of the world around us, for humankind and the richness of love, for each new day of forgiveness and grace. With thanksgiving, we remember the one who was with you from the beginning, through whom all things were made, whose life is the light of the world, and who became flesh and lived among us as Jesus. For his life and ministry, for his teaching and example, and for his love, we thank you, God. For his victory on the cross, we thank you. For the hope that comes through his resurrection, we thank you, O God. For the promise that in him all things are made new, we give you thanks and praise. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, after breaking it, he shared it with his disciples and said, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. This is the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Will you pray with me once more? Grant, O God, that your Holy Spirit may be with us, and that through this bread and cup, set apart for remembrance and thanksgiving, that Christ may come to dwell among us, and through him we may come to know you more fully. Knowing you, Lord, is life eternal. Bless these cups, this juice, bless these elements as we prepare to take them in humility and thanksgiving. May your spirit move among us as we celebrate this Passover feast. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
good news is we're about out of these, so the next batch I order, I'm going to try a different style. Thank you. 